All right, hello everybody. This is Training Without Conflict podcast number 15. And today's guest is Dr. Michael Peronik, who is a professor in the Department of Psy Psychology at Western Virginia, West Virginia University. Uh, he's been actively involved in experimental analysis of operant behavior for over 30 years. Also well known for his uh, programmatic research on condition reinforcement, avoidance, and um, it's actually quite extensive and, and we will list all of the um, um, credentials uh, below the podcast. Um, Michael has been appointed to key editorial position for major journals in behavior analysis, represented behavior analysis on the Federation of Behavior, Psychology, Psychological and Cognitive Sciences and served on numerous committees. I, I know I'm missing quite a bit of the introduction because again, you've been on the field for a very long time and very well accomplished. Um, so again, I, I will let you introduce yourself for a moment. The reason I invited um, Dr. Perona is because of few of the studies that I, I stumbled upon and they were, I found them very interesting and I think you know, um, dog training, animal learning, human learning, psychology, they in some ways overlap and we learn from one and we use it to the other and back and forth. There is a lot of exchange. And uh, so the, the originally my, like what really introduced me to is one, one study that was the negative effects of positive reinforcement back in 2003 and and then there was another one that you did in collaboration with um, a few other colleagues of yours uh, on the negative reinforcement by timeout and avoidance and and basically i i, I believe that it, it, we may have some interesting conversation of of you know i i want to hear a lot of your findings and even though at the moment you, you, you've moved on and not so much work from what I understand with, with animals in the laboratory, but I believe that as dog trainers, we, we have some takeaways to, you know, we benefit from. So um, just, just give me a little bit of, uh, more about yourself. I know I kind of rushed through everything, but. Um, well, <laughs> I'm an old man, so if you, if you went through all my uh, all the little details of my biography, it would be pretty boring. Um, well, uh, I'm a professor here at, at West Virginia University. I've been here since 1984. Um, I, uh, I, uh, over my career, I've done a mix of uh, basic opera research with humans and with animals. Uh, in uh, the last few years, I've concentrated mainly on uh, studies involving animals, uh, rats and pigeons. And uh, my students and I study a, a variety of basic processes uh, involving both positive and negative reinforcement. Yeah, so I, that's great that you, you're actually still currently uh, uh, doing some stuff with, with animals. That's, uh, that's very, very cool. I, I'm not even sure where to start, but we could like go over a little bit about the, that the negative side effects of positive reinforcement. Normally, at least in the dog training world, we as dog trainers are very, like I'm, I'm not sure, but we are quite divided. Um, there is a, a very, there is trainers that are in the middle of things, but there is two extremes to where we are talking about strictly positive reinforcement, strictly is the way to go and is far more superior than any other approach. And I have like, like, you know, when we talk about positive reinforcement, of course, there is, there are some, some downfalls and there is sometimes need for different approaches. Um, but what, what is your just general stand on, do, do you believe that something that one f approach, one one reinforcement is superior than the other. And of course, there is always the, 
like if, even if we go back to like, I don't know, was it 1975, Michael studied to where he introduced the idea that reinforcement includes negative and positive, and we should kind of abandon that idea and divide them. Um, that, that, talk to me a little bit about this. This is something that will be very interesting to the dog trainer audiences. Okay, well, um, you know, you, you, you've you referenced uh, the, the paper I wrote a number of years ago called uh, Negative Effects of Positive Reinforcement, which uh, was actually uh, my presidential address for the Association for Behavior Analysis International. Um, and the purpose of that wasn't to argue that positive reinforcement is bad and negative reinforcement is good. It was rather to uh, point out that the common assumption, which is that positive reinforcement is always good and negative reinforcement is always bad, that 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 uh, assumption is is uh, absolutely incorrect. And what I tried to do in the paper is show that, uh, first of all, uh, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between positive and negative reinforcement, and that's a uh, partly because of uh, the, the arguments that Jack Michael made in the paper that you just mentioned. Um, and it's it's partly because uh, negative reinforcement is an inevitable uh, element of the natural environment. And it has many, many positive effects. So to uh, dis, you know just dispose of negative reinforcement as if it were, anathema as if it were you know something that that should be avoided at all costs just doesn't make sense you know you can you can train up all kinds of uh, maladaptive and self-defeating behaviors with positive reinforcement right right <laughs> I mean, right i'm sure you've you've seen novice uh, dog trainers train dogs to do bad things yes and, in uh, fact we, there, uh, there is a saying that all bad behaviors have been most likely positively reinforced some at some point of time, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, now, you know, I'm not suggesting that the way to train a dog to uh, do whatever it is that you want to do is to uh, electrify its feet and turn off the electricity when it does something right. That would be that would be barbaric. Exactly. <laughs> but I will point out that uh, uh, negative reinforcement is what keeps you from stepping off the curb without looking when you're walking down the street. Now consider, uh, when you walk down the street in, a, in an urban environment, uh, there are cars whizzing back and forth, and maybe they're only going 25 or 30 miles an hour, but if you step in front of one of them, you're going to be dead, or, or maybe worse. And, uh, and yet we walk down up and down the street every day within a few feet of these massive machines that could be deadly and we don't worry about it at all we're not scared we're not upset we're not anxious and why not because we are proficient in avoiding the danger that lurks just a few feet away we have a non the negative reinforcement contingencies are so effective that they control our behavior and they don't bother us in the least. Now, maybe when, if we could look back far enough into our childhood, maybe when our parents were teaching us how to cross the street and to look both ways and all that, maybe we were a little anxious as, as, as that kind of behavior was being acquired. But by the time one is, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, probably earlier than that, we negotiate, uh, uh, travel throughout cities without being scared at all. And this is negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is why we uh, button our coats when it's cold. Yes. In, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of good things that happen because of negative reinforcement and to suggest that uh, negative reinforcement uh, in itself is a bad thing would just be incorrect. Do you find that I mean like I, as I mentioned, in the dog training world, this is this is a problem. It's, it's you know we're we're quite divided, and and 
for whatever reason associating just just throwing the word negative reinforcement or positive punishment or any use of aversive immediately uh, resonates with something horrible happening is that do you find anything like this do you have to deal with something like this when you when you even when you teach your in your classes or how <laughs> yes oh yes uh, uh, I certainly do and uh, what I find is that uh, the the antidote is showing students the basic research in these areas and uh, if possible getting the getting them to participate in the research in these areas. Um, over the years, I've, uh, I've, had, I've done lots of studies involving um, avoidance of electric shock. And one might think that a rat that uh, is exposed to an avoidance schedule day in and day out, month after month, these are steady state experiments, would be a skittish or difficult animal to work with. But in fact, they're completely friendly and docile. They um, uh, probably largely because they they very uh, quickly become proficient avoiders. And um, and in my laboratory, a rat can sometimes go an hour or two without getting a single shock. In fact, that's what makes it so fascinating, Ivan. Is if you were to look inside an operant chamber in my laboratory, you might see a rat that's pressing a lever and nothing's happening. Nothing happens before the rat presses a lever, nothing happens after the rat presses a lever, and they go on and they do this for an hour or two at a time. And you'd say, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. uh, nothing's happening. It appears to be that the schedule's extinction, but it's not, it's a shock postponement schedule and somehow the animal, animal's behavior comes under the control of this schedule. The rat itself is quite calm. Right. Quite calm, pretty laid back, uh, not the least bit skittish. And when the experiment's over, very easy to handle. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it, we still don't know. We still don't have a, uh, a, a consensus about what is reinforcing this behavior. Obviously, the reinforcement is obscure. We know what the schedule is doing. We know that we know what the schedule is, but we don't know the reinforcement mechanism that the schedule is activating. And that's what makes it so interesting. But I'm not a bad person because I because I study this. I'm not mean to the rats. I love the rats. And their their health and well being is of critical importance to us because our experiments often last uh, most of the lifespan of the animal. So we need uh -huh. them to be hale and hearty. So obviously, when we use any form of aversive, things can go sideways. Sure. And normally, what, what, what needs to go wrong for this to happen? Well, um, like we, we talk about contingent and non-contingent, which is very big deal, right? Um, but what, what do you find in, in when you work with them? Well, I, you know, um, I think it's important to uh, uh, maintain a, uh, a careful distinction between, as you say, negative reinforcement and positive punishment. They're both, they're, they're unified in the sense that they both fall under the category of aversive control. Um, my guess, and I'm guessing, uh, is that a lot of dog training would, would probably be more likely to involve punishment than negative reinforcement. Um, and, and the thing about punishment that's very clear in the laboratory is that very mild stimuli can function as effective punishers. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in, in my laboratory, I've studied both punishment and, and avoidance, and I've used other stimuli besides electric shock. But just with electric shock, to, to uh, get a rat to acquire and maintain proficient avoidance requires an electric shock of about one milliamp. Now, to you and me, one milliamp is nothing. You can barely feel it. But to a little rat, 
it's it's an unpleasant experience. One million. But to suppress responding, you need much less than that. So if you train a rat on, let's say, a variable interval schedule of food reinforcement, and then you superimpose on that electric shock punishment, you only need 0.2 or 0.3 milliamps to suppress behavior. Now notice that a 0.2 milliamp shock will not sustain negative reinforcement. It will not, it will not sustain avoidance. They, a rat will not work to avoid a shock that mild. But in a punishment paradigm, that mild of a shock will serve as a highly effective punisher. Now, this is this is not a peculiarity of rats. You can see this in people, too. There have been a, a number of, of human operant experiments that have shown that a very tiny fraction of a penny will function as an effective punisher. And, and so... Uh, uh, we are very sensitive. We we mammals, at least, seem to be very sensitive to um, punitive contingencies, and it doesn't take much of a uh, of a punishing stimulus to be effective. So I think the danger that uh, that it, it is that you need to be aware of the most is that if you're going to use a punishment contingency, you can be very gentle. <laughs> Yes. A very gentle rebuke can, yes. can be effective. Somehow humans and dog trainers and probably just humans overall, we think of, oh, this is punishment. We need to be very uh, uh, amplify the, the intensity. And, and that's exactly like this is very, very um, interesting. And I think it's for, for sure very um, well recorded in, in a lot of research. There is a lot of different rules that need to happen through punishment so it doesn't become a conditioned reinforcer and, and sure right so the but when all those rules are met as you said a very low level will do the job to punish to where to convince the dog to actually avoid or escape and and it's a different different story then it depends on yeah that's very very interesting well i don't i mean uh I've I've had pets over the years. I've had dogs and cats both, and uh, I know this. I'm not going to teach a dog to do any tricks by punishing it, by punishing its behavior. But I might be able to facilitate uh, the uh, acquisition of behavior by um, gently punishing uh, conflicting behavior or um, a distracting behavior, and I suspect that any dog owner uh, uh, that, that cares about its dog engages in punishment on a frequent basis, but they would never label it that. So they might just, they might just say, no, no, yes. no, no, yes. you know, something like that. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a punishment procedure. <laughs> you know, people tend to think of punishment as something that you do to the animal in anger. You know, you're Correct. frustrated, you're angry, and you whack the dog. Well, <laughs> that, that's uh, that's not an effective uh, punishment procedure. Yes, that's revenge. <laughs> in certain in certain dog training circles, the that condition punisher, like like saying no, um, it's not even called punisher. They they call it interrupter. Just because the word punishment has, it's such a loaded word. And for some reason, we are a, a, in the dog training uh, industry, we are very afraid to, to say, oh, we have to punish something because it will help us suppress and then therefore we can reinforce the good behaviors when they happen. But um, finding finding the... It's very polarized, the dog training is. And I, I believe somehow the whole society at the moment is, is very polarized on, on what is, what, where the boundaries, boundaries between becoming unethical and, and doing, doing stupid things to, to an animal 
versus intelligently applying aversive to 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 accomplish to to get a result and with negative reinforcement it's uh, it's almost the same thing um the way i look at negative reinforcement in when when done right is actually very like when we look at even a silly game as uh what what uh, hot hands you know it's a it's a game of negative reinforcement it has an aversive element but it's so interesting and it's like little kids will play it forever and yes we can go wrong but as long as like if we if we focus on the negative reinforcement part we have able to explain the way out then actually I I believe that it becomes uh, almost it builds certain level of confidence of I I I'm somebody I can I can avoid things I know how to manage and how to be more resilient with uh um just just go on with life right in many cases, well, first, I don't have a, I personally have no problem if instead of saying we're going to punish certain behavior in the dog, that we're going to discourage it, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's one thing, you know, when I use the word punishment in my research, I'm using it as a technical term. And it's unfortunate that uh, when it's used outside the technical literature, it has such a, um, as you say, it has it's a loaded term, um, and so uh, in working with clients uh, and with colleagues, if 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 there's a different kind of jargon that emerges in the world of, of dog training, that makes sense to me, and uh, I certainly uh, wouldn't fault anybody for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I think in I think um, one of the one of the most interesting uh, forms of negative reinforcement is often referred to as compassion i mean think about this if you if you uh, watch television uh uh you will you will certainly see commercials where they show dogs and cats and other cute animals that are being abused you know they show them chained up they show them starving they yes. show them crying and they and then they say, why don't you send us nineteen dollars a month so we can s- stop this? Well, people look at that, and they and it brings it. Their eyes get moist. I mean, if they have any kind of soul, right? They look at that. Their their eyes get moist. Their heart goes out to these animals, and they feel pretty good about writing a check for nineteen dollars or signing up to send a check every month. We call we don't call that negative reinforcement, but that's exactly what it is. We call it compassion, and and you know that's there's so many appeals like that, uh, and, and and I'm not saying they're wrong. Some people might say it's an emotional manipulation. I, I wouldn't go that far. People are showing the state of the world and saying you can make it better, but they 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 get you to make it better by showing you something bad. And telling you that you can make the bad go away, that's that's negative reinforcement. Many years ago, the uh, uh, the great observer of the human condition, H. L. Mencken, uh, in an essay mentioned uh, uh, talked a little bit about altruism. Now, you know, altruism is supposed to be the purest form of charity, and he says. Uh, I'll paraphrase, but he says altruism, even in its purest form, uh, happens because it it's uncomfortable to have unhappy people around. You know, it we we don't our heart goes out to unhappy people, yes. to crying children, to 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 uh, starving animals. Uh, to crying colleagues, you know, to students who are upset. Our heart goes out to them, and we do what we can to help. That's negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is part of what us helps us make the world a better place. Wow, interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, hmm. That that's something to really, yeah. It, it's a. 
I, I almost need to, but, but it's so true. This is, uh, there is so many different takes on, on what negative reinforcement is. Um, they're thinking about it too narrowly, Ivan. When you, uh, do you cook? Of course, you, I love it. Well, so you, you, uh, here you are in your uh, kitchen and you're, uh, you're picking up, uh, let's make it very simple. You're picking up a pot of boiling water. Are you scared? Are you upset? Are you anxious? Do you break up into a, into a sweat knowing that you're going to have to do this? Correct. No, you just go about it. I don't. I doubt that you even think about it much. But you've acquired a repertoire of very skilled behavior, and you know exactly how to pick up the pan and how to move it from burner to stove, from burner to burner, burner to counter, without spilling hot water and hurting yourself. Um, this is this is avoidance behavior that's uh, that was it's not too hard to figure out how it got started and it's maintained by negative reinforcement contingencies but these are good things they keep you from getting your fingers burned or worse and they don't generate a bunch of emotional byproducts too many people love to cook even <laughs> even though they're they're inches away from uh, heat that could do serious serious damage yes and sometimes they're not scared they're not scared exactly exactly very very good point and sometimes you pay the price for being negligent but you know exactly what you did and you know exactly how to change it for the next at least two years before you lose your guard again and, and yeah, um, about every every two or three years, I I manage to uh, burn burn something, getting a, <laughs> uh, something out of the oven. Yes, I I admit it, and I, I always feel very stupid when I've done it. And just like you pointed out, which is super interesting, how how a rat can be in 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 the process of navigating in the 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 laboratory and and. Another example, I have, I have a school for dog trainers and I bring a, a, my, my analogy is with the electricians that go in this high voltage poles and they don't go to work every day, stressed out, sweating, that they have an answer. And it is the most critical point of negative reinforcement from what I, from my experience in dog training is to to be able to show to the dog or animal or a human immediately how to escape and eventually how to completely avoid the aversive. Mm -hmm. If we have that, even if we have a, a very brief element of, oh wow, this is a, a little bit, I'm, I'm stressed about it, I, it's a puzzle, can I solve it? But the moment it gets solved, all that fear and all that stress is resolved, correct? Yes, yeah. And go on. Go ahead. Well, uh, the, the, I guess like in, at least in the dog world, we tend to get stuck on that moment of solving the puzzle and pointing out that, okay, it's very bad, but this is at the moment when the dog is actually searching for solution. And it's very temporary moment, assuming that we have a, a proper schedule and, and we are on the way to learning how to escape, first how to escape and next obviously how to avoid. And, and if the animal gets stuck in that place, we have not done our job correctly, right? That's right. And you know, the, the, uh, the dog is equipped to cope with uh, aversive contingencies. We know this because its mother uh, engages in aversive contingencies, right? I mean, uh, the, the mother will let, let out a low growl or low pitched bark uh, when, the, when the puppy does something wrong. And uh, uh, I, have a, I have a 16 year old cat right now that's coping with a kitten. And the cat, uh, the old cat sets boundaries for the kitten. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and will will 
uh, gently but firmly, you know, give it a bat with its paw and give it a little noise with its with its meow, you know, to let the kitten know that uh, it's transgressed. And this is not this isn't something that anybody had to train. This is natural natural behaviors. It, and and uh, if the organisms were devastated by this, <laughs> we wouldn't have cats or dogs anymore because they wouldn't tolerate being around their conspecifics to procreate. When, whenever we talk about this, I always bring out the, it, it's almost like a fundamental law of biology or, or whatever to where we, we would approach something pleasant and we would avoid something unpleasant. And we are, it's not something that we need to learn. It's, it's like programmed, it's baked in our DNAs and we know exactly how to navigate through, through all this, correct? And so taking like, like blaming negative or I shouldn't even say negative reinforcement, but a, an aversive experience altogether as something bad. We, it has such an important place, as you said, like we would, all of us will, we will not be alive if we don't know how to respond correctly to aversive. And it doesn't necessarily always need to go wrong. It's actually very beneficial for, for any living, I mean, any, any simple cell organism will back off from, from something that it, it alarms to danger, correct? Yes, and you know, I think the uh, I think the objection uh, by uh, therapists and I suppose uh, animal trainers as well, I think the objection would probably be go something like this: Well, the natural world is one thing, but we're contriving these contingencies as part of a training process, and we shouldn't do anything to our our students, our pets, our clients. Um, uh, that would would uh, cause intentionally cause them distress, mm -hmm. and you know I, I, I'm inclined to agree. I think that you certainly don't want to uh, create undue distress, but there are many uh, forms of negative reinforcement and punishment that don't really generate the kinds of byproducts that people are talking about, or if they do, they're mild and temporary. Temporary is a key key word. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, uh, there are many surprising results that that uh, people are often unaware of. In the category that uh, positive reinforcement is good, people overlook the fact that we have lots of research in the laboratory that shows that schedules of positive reinforcement have aversive character. And there are portions of sessions where animals will reliably uh, engage in a response to turn off the experiment. They will actually act to escape from schedules of positive reinforcement. Interesting. This is something that's been known since the 60s, although we know more about the conditions that generate it today than we did in 1960. But a, a schedule of positive reinforcement um, well, you would think that that if you take a hungry pigeon and you put it on an intermittent schedule of food reinforcement, that that would be the best thing and it would be a positive thing through and through. And a stimulus correlated with the schedule would be a, a, a positive condition reinforcer. But it doesn't work that way, Ivan. It depends on the context. So if you have, let's say, a VI one minute schedule and it alternates with extinction I one minute schedule becomes a very positive thing and the stimulus correlated with it becomes a condition reinforcer but if you take that same vi one minute schedule and you alternate it with a vi 30 second schedule a schedule that's twice as dense in terms of reinforcement then that VI one minute schedule becomes a negative thing and a stimulus correlated with it becomes a conditioned punisher. Same schedule, same stimulus goes from being a reinforcer to a punisher because of the context in which it's embedded. So you can't just 
get tunnel vision and look at just one element and say, well, that's positive reinforcement and a stimulus correlated with it's going to be good because the context matters. And it's so easy to lose sight of the context. Interesting. And and ultimately, the way that the, the brain takes it, the way that brain perceives it, it experiences the same emotional and, and a, 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 an aversive response, correct? Right. And Right. <laughs> you know, uh, if I told you that uh, I was going to I was going to hire you for a job next year and I was going to pay you five million dollars. I suspect you'd be happy. But there are professional athletes all over the world, soccer players, baseball players, football players, basketball players. If they if they were told they were going to make five million dollars next year, they'd be very upset. They'd be very unhappy. Yes, <laughs> because in their world. That's uh, that's uh, an insult. Same amount of money, different environmental context. Is $5 million good or bad? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And, and then there is that, that other element that sometimes, actually not sometimes, quite often, if we keep, if, if we stay stay outside now step outside the the skinner box but if we keep rewarding a behavior without trying to focus on how we can create whatever we need to do to make the behavior itself rewarding sometimes a very natural behavior that the person or the animal likes to do we can deflect it, we can totally derail it, but positive reinforcement expecting some, some uh, treat reward or money from, for doing what they originally actually really love doing. In dog training, it's a big, uh, um, I, I am sure with humans it's the same probably. The moment we start expecting, okay, you will pay me then how much are you going to pay me? And then you can, as you said, we become, oh, you're not paying me enough. I, I forget that I actually love doing this already without any reward at all, correct? Yes, yes. Well, um, you know, uh, sometimes it's argued that uh, extrinsic uh, rewards uh, are maladaptive because they, they take control over behavior that would otherwise be reinforced by its intrinsic consequences. And I, I guess that's possible, but in a carefully crafted uh, training program, uh, extrinsic reinforcers or contrived reinforcers are only used uh, until the behavior comes under the control of its natural consequences. Skinner points out that um, if you if you left the acquisition of reading to natural consequences, it would probably never be acquired. Mm -hmm. So, you know, reading has to be taught explicitly and reinforced with grades and praise and who knows what else. And eventually, through these contrived reinforcers and contrived contingencies, the child develops a strong enough reading repertoire that they will come to read comic books or storybooks or novels or what have you, instructions on how to build something, things that where the reinforcer comes uh, naturally out of the act of reading. But to get there, you have to use contrived contingencies and artificial reinforcers. And, and, uh, the, the trick is to know when to transfer control from one to the other. You know, once the kid starts reading Superman comic books and enjoys doing yes. it, you don't pay him for reading Superman That will be a mistake, books. right? right. <laughs> <laughs> you, might, you, might, you might have paid him to do his reading and phonics homework, but once he learns how to read well enough that he can enjoy reading material, you, you leave him alone. Very true. 
since we mentioned Skinner, we we can go in a little bit further with it because I mean, obviously, there there is so many things that he brought to the table that are so valid, but at the same time, I feel like there there was it, it's there is a lot of controversial stuff in dog training. This this is one one thing I want to hear your opinion on. Um, it's in certain circles of dog trainers, it's very common, very popular to do errorless learning. And of course, Skinner presented it at the time. It was a big thing. Like I, I, you know, I, the only exposure to it I have is YouTube videos of, of these machines that look like computers, but you know, and, and basically go through the process, but for some reason it never really took off. We obviously are not using this at school, uh, that, that, uh, system, but we are still talking about it and we're still believing that it's, it's, um, there is a place and it, and, and actually it can, it can be just as good as trial and error. How, how I, I want to hear your opinion on this. Well, there's, there's two, at least two issues here. One is, um, is, uh, is errorless learning, um, possible? Uh, and if so, does it have an advantage over learning with with errors, the uh, the the original or the classic experiment was uh, Herb Terrace's doctoral dissertation, and um, he used different methods to train a discrimination, a simple discrimination in pigeons, and he showed that the pigeons that that uh, uh, acquired the discrimination with a very very small number of errors. Um, were not, he, he first he showed it was possible to do that, and secondly, uh, he showed that it, the stimulus that was correlated, or well, let me put it this way: there were no negative behavioral byproducts mm -hmm. of the errorless discrimination. Now later, uh, Mark Rilling at uh, Michigan State, he and his students showed that uh, he, he pointed out some of the confounded variables in Terrace's work and showed that um, it wasn't the errors per se that that uh, determined whether the uh, there was going to be uh, emotional byproducts in discrimination learning. It was the timing of the introduction of the negative discriminative stimulus. And so um, it was an oh, it was a it was an overgeneralization. Uh, to argue that errorless discrimination was inherently superior. Now Skinner, it, it, Skinner with his his um, development of teaching machines, uh, I don't know if he was as concerned about errorless learning as he was about shaping up behavior in a in a way that um, academic kind of behavior in a way that was uh, that engaged the the student and advanced in such small steps that the the uh, student was unlikely to make an error. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's what Skinner accomplished with his uh, programmed instruction uh, that he uh, writ that he wrote with um, uh, James Holland. Uh, and I think other people who've who've gone to the trouble of, of uh, creating high quality programmed instruction have had similar results. Uh, but I think it's a very difficult thing to do well. And uh, I'm not I'm not an educational psychologist and I don't follow that literature, but I, I don't think there's a lot of it. Um, and I think it's because it's it's uh, it's pretty labor intensive. Yeah. And at least I mean to generate it's labor intensive to generate the materials. Once they're generated, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I I've like I've read some and I'm, I'm not sure like I I, I don't want to give the wrong references but th there is a point where it, it does work to some point and it does build some confidence in the student 
that I can, I am, I'm good at this because we are avoiding the pointing the finger of, no, you failed, correct? But the, as it gets a little bit more complex, then there is the need of, oops, you, you went the wrong path. Well, in, in if, if you look at, uh, at Skinner's programmed instruction, um, he, he, he's, he's taking advantage of the extensive verbal repertoire and knowledge base of the student. He's taking advantage of that. But when you, when you train a dog, there's, you don't have that kind of repertoire to leverage. And in human work, uh, you're not going to create uh, skilled perform the skilled performance of a surgeon, or a baseball pitcher, or a sculptor, or a painter. I'm talking about an artistic painter. Mm-hmm. You're not going to shape up that kind of behavior without lots of errors, right? No, no. You you show me somebody who claims that they can train a kid to uh, paint like uh, Rembrandt uh, right out of the, you know without ever making without ever producing junk, and I and I will uh, I will tell you that you're talking to a fool. Um, so you know skilled skilled physical performances uh, have to be shaped up in a in a different way than academic performances that are already building on on strong uh, verbal and academic behavior. Yeah, yes, and then there is the the obvious difference between humans and animals that we can instruct and humans, and it, we really <laughs> cannot yeah. do that with animals. And then this is where the aversion, aversion has a place because it's a, it really goes back to that fundamental law. What, what do you think about where where how how far down you think the use of aversive or punishment or negative reinforcement where where exactly was that starting point that we said this is not a good idea and it's not it didn't not really even morally i think originally it was like it just doesn't work i i don't know if i'm right well i think uh, it, I, I haven't done a historical study of it, but uh, my I, what I believe is that this is largely uh, Skinner's influence. Uh, Skinner was um, a hedonist, you know. I say that in the most uh, non-judgmental way. He wanted he wanted people to be happy. He wanted people to enjoy life, and he saw the uh, the root to that to be positive reinforcement. And he pointed out some of the uh, uh, reliances that governments have on aversive control. And he felt that these were the kinds of things that made people unhappy with their governments and generated rebellion and other forms of counter control. So he, he actively argued against punishment as a social control measure. And I guess by extension, as a topic of experimental analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, Sidman, uh, Murray Sidman, uh, who of course is closely associated with uh, yes. the development of the free operant avoidance schedule, later wrote a book called uh, Coercion, Coercion and its Fallout yes. and argued that any form of punishment or negative reinforcement was uh, by definition coercive. I think the influence of, 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 of Skinner in general and then uh, Sidman's later uh, writings in this area have done a lot to discourage the uh, analysis of aversive control by operant psychologists, by behavior analysts. But there's a whole bunch of research on it by neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists, so we've left it to them. And the reason they're studying it is because it's clearly a part of the natural world. And uh, I think that uh, uh, perhaps Skinner has a, a, can make some valid points about social control mechanisms, but it, when it comes to basic experimental analysis, we want to understand all the world's processes. And uh, 
And and if these are processes that take place in the natural world, we should be studying them. Yes. You know, a a, a new a, a physicist doesn't say I'm not going to I'm I'm going to ignore gravitation because when people fall out of trees, they hurt themselves, right? You know, they study it because it's part of the world. That's that's excellent. <laughs> that's brilliant. No, it's very true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. I knew we we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Nurture, nature, the endless debate. Um, there is a, I don't know if you've, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a older book now, popular book referred to a lot, the talent code. Basically it refers to if you, if you, repeat something long enough, you will get very proficient and, and you will overcome your genetic predisposition. But regardless of that, um, it's an endless, never ending debate. And how, how, what, what is your take on genetic predisposition versus the environment? Of course they will overlap, but I will, I, I, I'm not going to say anything more and let you talk. Well, um, I mean, uh, well, as you know, uh, uh, that functions as a reinforcer for a dog probably wouldn't function as a reinforcer for a uh, first grade child, you know. <laughs> so uh, clearly uh, uh, the uh, natural predispositions that uh, must be uh, uh, the result of genetic heritage have to have to be obeyed and they do set limits on on uh, the kind of repertoire that can be developed the the thing that I uh, I like to remind students of though is that the organism's uh, genetics is itself a product of the environment you know I tell the students that uh, Behavior is controlled by the environment, and the environment has three aspects. There's the contemporary environment, what's happening right now. There's the historical environment, the experiences that the person has had in the past. And then there's the ancestral environment, the environment of the organism's ancestors uh, that over generations uh, selected the genetics, the genetic heritage that this individual has today. So when you say to someone, you say to a child, you hold up, you hold up an object and you say, what is this? And they say, apple. Well, that what what's happening right now is the is this the this this object and the question, what is this? But the child can only respond apple if it's had certain experiences, including, for example, experiences in a verbal community that taught it English mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in which it experienced apples. But then there's also the genetic heritage that it had to have. It has a certain, it has a visual system uh, to see the apple and an auditory stimulus to hear the question. If the, if the organism's ancestors had uh, spent their time on the ocean floor, it wouldn't have the, that kind of uh, uh sensory systems. So all these things work together, but inevitably they're all traced to the environment. In a sense, there is no nature versus nurture. It's all, it's all nurture. Right. Right. Um, That's not a, it's a theoretical position. It's not very practical. It doesn't help. It doesn't help someone to, to train dogs, I suppose. Well, uh, but it does give you a framework. <clears throat> yes, yes. Where it some sometimes where dog dog trainers can get into get stuck, I should say, trying to let's say correct some inappropriate in their mind behavior is that uh, it's a very normal and genetically programmed behavior, and if we continuously try to suppress it and it goes again that generic predisposition it will actually uh, um, reach certain level of breakdown instead of finding a way to to accept that this is there and it's strong and 
looking for a way to just guide it into something else instead of really go against the genetic makeup. Um, so that's a that's a common, quite common in dog training, especially with I shouldn't say young trainers, but trainers that are in in beginning um, and. W- you know, we as dog trainers, we believe that we can control and we can control behavior no matter what. And uh, very often, I think we go head on against uh, uh, something that it's selectively, especially with dogs, we we breed them selectively to do certain things. Like imagine if we decide that we have a hunting dog, a pointer, and we say, oh, we're going to stop him from pointing. Uh, it just as an example. This will, uh, I mean, this will burn the brain <laughs> simply because the, the dog's not even at a certain level, not even consciously, like it's not the, the body that's doing it. It's, the, it's everything programmed to do that behavior, right? Right, you, you might as well say we're going to stop the dog from seeing, or stop the dog from hearing. It, yeah, it, it can't, those beha- You know, it's it's interesting. We never talk about about seeing and hearing that way. You know, we're gonna we're gonna train the dog to stop hearing, but that's behavior. It's just behavior that's so deeply embedded into the uh, organism's uh, biological makeup that it never occurs to us to to try to modify it. And it's a good thing too. <laughs> I don't think it would work very well. Right. I had bearded collies mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the, that's a herding breed. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty good at uh, getting them to stop herding two or three children. If two or three children were running around in the backyard, they wouldn't try to herd them. But if there were five or six, I have to. <laughs> I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. <laughs> yes, and even even if we are able to to stop it at the moment, we we are not taking it out of their uh, um, repertoire. But, right. The animal. You. What I. I would. I would guess that you're training the dog to. Uh, uh, I guess you could say actively suppress. The behavior they're 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 actively doing something that's incompatible you know i have a, a colleague here at the university you know actually he's retired now he's a geologist but he's a natural dog trainer and he he did this with two different dogs so i know it wasn't a pure accident but he could take this dog and have it sit he'd say sit and the dog would sit and then he would take a piece of cheese and he would put it on the dog's snout and the dog would sit there and he, the dog, you could see the dog is kind of getting a little anxious and it's drooling, yes. <laughs> it's yes. drooling. And then he'd say, go. And the dog would flip the cheese up in the air and as it came down, snap it right up. He did this with two different dogs. This, is, this goes against everything natural to this dog. But it, the dog couldn't suppress everything. Correct. It's clearly, you know, it's you can see it's struggling to stay still, and it's drooling. <laughs> yes. But an, an impressive performance, nevertheless. We get confused quite often when we talk about operant and classical conditioning. And to a very basic level sometimes, what can you tell dog trainers um, like like the what are the different takeaways from from both how how do they how how are they different I don't know to you know to what extent um, classical conditioning is involved in dog training I guess the most obvious case is clicker training yeah, uh, I guess the way what we when we talk about classical conditioning a lot, uh, oftentimes we include it. We include that emotional aspect of the classical conditioning, and and you know basically pairing the behavior with certain emotions, and then we talk that there is. Well, an I element. guess you know, um, in, in 
one of the things that we know about classical conditioning is that the uh, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus have to occur in close temporal proximity, and the uh, conditioned stimulus has to come first, and there has to be uh, something distinctive about about both stimuli. So I guess if uh, if uh, John Doe what, you know, who's a tall man with a beard and wears a red cap, uh, walks into the dog training session and starts uh, kicking the dog. Uh, I think there's a pretty good chance that the next time John Doe shows up, the dog is going to uh, run away from him. That is, the, he will have become a conditioned aversive stimulus by virtue of classical conditioning. Now, what the most relevant aspect of John Doe is it might not be clear. It might not have anything to do with the cap, the beard, or his height. It might be his scent. Uh, it might be his sound. Uh, but um, uh, clearly, that would create, you know, that that would be a, a distinctive stimulus, a new stimulus, and a new con a new pairing of the pain with that stimulus. But if if John Doe were part of the normal training of the dog part of the environment for months and then uncharacteristically engaged in this behavior, it would be much less likely that he would become a conditioned aversive stimulus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, look, it, if you, uh, if, if you, if, if you take the story of Pavlov's dog, uh, you know, Pavlov, when the, what Pavlov observed is when the, uh, the feeder would come into the, uh, the room where the dog was housed, the dog would start to salivate because the feeder always signaled that food was forthcoming. But the dog didn't salivate to the door to the site of the doorknob to the room. Yes, because it was a static feature; it was there whether food was coming or not. Yes, it was if, the if, salient. If John Doe is there all the time, and then and then suddenly there's a pairing of John Doe with with an aversive stimulus. Uh, it, it's 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 less likely that, that effective classical conditioning will occur. So I guess what that would mean is if, if a dog trainer is doing you know, a good job and uh, is primarily associated with positive reinforcement, uh, an occasional mistake Miscop, that might yep. involve aversive stimuli shouldn't uh, disqualify the trainer. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't create the, any emotional response should be temporary. That's what the, that's what the uh, basic literature would suggest, and 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 actually goes further than that. The the clinical literature on punishment, such as such as it exists, uh, finds very little evidence of serious uh, emotional byproducts of punishment when it's carried out by the same therapists who also provide reinforcement. Yes, it's very, I think this is a very important uh, distinction to be made that the, the um, being the person or the animal, they have to be, they have to relate and trust and, and have some, some relationship with the, the person or trainer that does implement the punishment. It's critical. And then there is a, of course, uh, uh, a place for reconciliation if needed to where mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, I, I really, I don't hate you. I don't want to kill you. It's just don't, <laughs> don't do this. Right. <laughs> well, I mentioned to you that I have a kitten and, uh, the, the, uh, not too long ago, this kitten was very small and it followed me around. Like you wouldn't believe. And, was would get right under my feet. And one time I, I took a step backwards and I stepped on the cat, the kitten. And th this was a very unhappy kitten. It hurt. And and she ran away, obviously. But uh, a few minutes later, she was back and she was sitting on my lap and purring, you know. And uh, I think if her entire experience was with me is that if I just walked into her life and stepped on her, Yes. She wouldn't have come back. Yes. <laughs> but that was just one 
uh, incident in what otherwise was a, a pretty uh, richly reinforcing uh, relationship. Because I fed her all the time, you know. Yes. And fed her and loved her and so on. Yes. I, uh, yeah, this this is something that somehow we we always, at, in, in dog training, we kind of fail to... to understand the importance of this like like if you i'll give you some examples we let's say a trainer gets a dog in training in like you know board and train and there is a behavior problem and very often especially trainers that are inexperienced they would rush into tackling that problem today, the moment the dog comes in without having to build that trust and, and like, hey, I I like you. I, like we, we actually, you know, and, and then things, even though we are suppressing behavior and it seems like we're successful, the dog has no, nowhere to, to go back to, uh, um, what is the word I'm looking for to 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 get that comfort of hey I, I'm you are not against me as a being you, you're just not liking that behavior and and this is a I think it's a critical point when we well there is many many rules with punishment but this is one big one to to have a report uh to where the animal or the human really looks at you in a certain way before before we start something to do like that you know uh in his book on coercion and its fallout sidman says that a person who uses shock becomes a shock yes but it but it's not true it's it's only true if that's the only thing the person does um if it were true we would all hate our parents, you know, be, uh, or at least traditionally, you know, when I I grew up in the 50s and uh, when you misbehaved, you were spanked. But I didn't stop. You know, I can remember my mother saying, wait until your father gets home. Right. <laughs> Classic. But I didn't hate my father. Yes, that is a very good point. And another one he makes. I, I will paraphrase because I'm not sure, but it's the, 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 the person that's punishing basically gets this reinforcement and grat it's gratifying. So, so the more you punish, the more you want to punish. And that also, I don't think uh, has any ground. Well, you know, uh, I, if, if uh, I, I would think that that would be most likely if the um well if if the dog is misbehaving if you're a professional dog trainer and the dog is misbehaving and you do some sort of mild punishment procedure to to stop the behavior so you can move on with the positive elements of the training um it may be reinforcing to get the misbehavior to stop but that's not as potent of a reinforcer as it is when someone is um, becomes really angry at some situation, lashes out, and then the situation goes away. That's uh, that's the kind of thing that becomes such a potent reinforcer that uh, uh, you do worry about someone who mm -hmm. will, they're, 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 the first tool that they pull out of the uh, toolbox is punishment. Yeah, uh, that's certainly not what. Not, not what we want to see. Correct, correct. Do you think certain people tend to, like w w what makes a certain person go that route instead of, is it is it the upbringing of this person? Because a lot of times well, we also would say, well, that person grew up in this kind of environment. He, he got all this, so therefore he is now Oh, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's an old expression. Uh, uh, I, it probably goes back to the 18th century: "Spare the rod and spoil the child." The mm. uh, the idea was that if you don't uh, 
if you don't punish uh, misbehavior, you're going to have a rotten kid, I guess. Mm. And uh, we don't see things quite that way anymore. We see punishment as something that uh, should be used uh, cautiously and selectively and only in the context of a uh, an environment that reinforces appropriate behavior. Yeah. Punishment by itself doesn't accomplish a lot except to stop. I mean, look, uh, if, if, <laughs> if you were, if you were, if you were uh, standing in your front yard and your small child suddenly darted out f- into the road, your natural reaction might be quite frightening to the child. And, uh, It would be a natural reaction, and it would probably uh, uh, greatly reduce the likelihood that the kid runs out into the street again. Um, That's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because you really have to have that kind of behavior stop. But but in terms of but it doesn't teach the kid how to cross the street. Yes, but that's why we have reinforcement. That's right. That's exactly (laughs) right. So uh, punishment by itself isn't going to accomplish. what you need to have accomplished it might accomplish certain things but it doesn't it doesn't train new behavior on the other hand um if you if you have a kid that runs out into the street a lot you're not going to have many opportunities (laughs) for Mm -hmm. positive reinforcement delayed conditioning does it work and if it works when would that be like like well um in the laboratory, uh, my colleague uh, down the hall, Andy Latal, has shown in a series of very elegant experiments that animals will learn, they will acquire behavior under conditions uh, of fairly long delayed reinforcement. But, but it takes a long time and the, the, uh, the, the end result is very small compared to what you would get with just a few immediate reinforcers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what happens in the short term triumphs over anything that happens in the long term. Uh, so I would think that uh, it would be fair to say that delayed reinforcement or delayed punishment for that matter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't work with with very long delays uh, unless there's some sort of signal that uh, connects the two. I think that's what clicker training is about. And you know, if if uh, if 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 the dog does something and a buzzer sound, a unique buzzer sounds for ten seconds, and then the food is delivered, that probably will work fine. But if the dog does something and ten seconds later it gets the food that's probably not going to work very well during initial acquisition. It might, it might work okay in maintenance, Mm -hmm. but when the behavior is, is really weak uh, as it is in the early stages of acquisition, immediate reinforcement is um, well, it might not be the only thing that works, but it's going to work better than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how about the backwards conditioning? Like that's a, that's a always very difficult one to discuss, at least well, in dog you know, training. If, if you look at if you look at backwards conditioning, uh, the, the you know the classic kind of backward conditioning experiments that uh, are of the sort that that are reported in textbooks and things like that, you will see that occasionally backwards conditioning will generate some uh, uh, conditioned responses. Response. Um, or what count as condition responses, but it's <laughs> it's not a reliable effect, and it's probably an artifact of some kind. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, it's noise. It's it's uh, the the uh, if you if if you want to generate condi- uh, classically conditioned responses, the the conditioned stimulus has to precede the uh, unconditioned stimulus. Even if, the, if, if they occur at the same time, it doesn't work very well. Um, one has to precede the other. It has to, in, in the mathematical sense, predict, like the, the tone has to predict 
the food. Um, if it if they come at the same time, the tone isn't doing anything. Correct. It doesn't predict anything. In correct. fact, it might not even be noticed by the animal because it it will be overshadowed, overshadowed. by the food, which is yes. a much more salient stimulus. There were some studies, and I, I I'm so bad with references, but there there was something to where they were pointing out that backward conditioning could actually be could could work very well in case of uh, um, some predatory instincts to, to where let's say let's say the something something happens to the rat and then the cat walks away mm. and that is there is that genetic buildup that can create that association. And I, I, I cannot think of the name of the, the researchers um, that it was very interesting. And it, yeah, I, I really don't know much like, like to, to most of dog trainers, backward conditioning is not something we, we rely or search on uh, for learning. To, to happen. Yeah, you wouldn't program, you wouldn't write a, a training program that relies cool. on backwards conditioning. Right. Um, yeah, well, the, the thing that you're describing, I can imagine that that could be the case. Um, uh, in the um, in the 70s, there was a lot of interest in um, uh, preparedness, you know, the idea that uh, organisms are prepared to i wouldn't put it this way but it's a little bit cognitive for me but they're prepared to associate certain kinds of events and uh, this was shown in a number of ways so just in the case of operant conditioning if you take if if you want to teach a rat to avoid shock and the response is jumping out of the box they'll learn it in two or three trials if uh, because it's a natural thing for the animal to do is to try to move physically move away from the source of aversive stimulation. If you require the rat to avoid shock by sta staying in place and pressing a lever, it takes a lot longer. Okay? And the idea is that the animal's prepared to learn one way rather than the other. Uh, another example is with uh, conditioned taste aversion. Yes, the you John can, Garcia's can, uh, experiments. You, right? you give the you give the rat uh, a distinctive flavor, something it's never tasted before, and you follow that up with something that makes it sick. Well, they'll after just one trial, they will avoid that flavor. But if instead of a flavor, you use a visual stimulus, sound like a visual. flashing light or a sound, they don't avoid that. So they, it, it, it's it, the the choice of the of the discrimin the choice of the condition stimulus isn't purely arbitrary. It depends on something that the the rat is bringing to the laboratory, something about their genetic heritage. So it, you know, in light of that, I can imagine there could be situations where. Um, very close backward conditioning might might be effective, mm -hmm. but it still wouldn't be as effective as, as forward, forward conditioning. Right. So my next one is very big one. Learned helplessness, and it, it, it is a very like it's a very common, very often brought up in the dog training industry to where like if we that it's very easy to reach that state and there is no way out and and it's there forever i have opinions i've i've read different uh um studies i know i know that even maya right after like two or three years after the original study they they did a follow-up studies to where they exposed the animal and they taught it how to escape and avoid, and they showed much more resistance and resilience to to becoming into that uh, uh, mental state to giving up. But I, I really want to hear uh, your take on this one. It's a very big one in the dog training community. 
It, is it is it a big issue because people see this uh, phenomenon interfering with their training? No, it's almost fictitious. It's almost like no, no. If if you're doing certain things, you will, you will, like if you use some form of aversion in in the training, it you're really risking the dog to go into learning helplessness. Therefore, you should avoid it at all costs. That that's the the narrative. I was uh, I was in graduate school when uh, Seligman and Meyer were doing that original research, and one of the striking things about it, remember the original research was done with dogs, and uh, they were using such severe electric shock applied, as, if I remember correctly, to the pads. Yes, that. It, it was such a severe shock that it produced projectile defecation. So, you know, this wasn't the run of the mill kind of uh, aversive stimuli that are likely to be used in, by a professional dog trainer. <laughs> this <Yes>. was, <laughs> this was really very special, Extreme. intense uh, stimulation. Now, I'm not an expert. It's been a long time since I've looked at that at that work, but that's what uh, struck many people about the original research. I don't think that uh, you know in in the um, in the it's 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 interesting in the human um, uh, applied literature when uh, punishment was was uh, more ex was viewed as more acceptable. The issue was never uh, producing learned helplessness. Uh, well, the issue wasn't a concern with learned helplessness. It was a concern with having a, a, a punisher that was effective in suppressing the bad behavior. Um, it, was, it wasn't like, oh, if we're not careful, all behavior is gonna stop. It doesn't seem likely in a in an environment where punishment is a, a very small component of an otherwise reinforcement based procedure, and that's not what was going on in those experiments and learned helplessness. It's not like the animal was uh, like this procedure was embedded in a uh, in, in a therapeutic environment. It wasn't that at all. It was yes, uh, it was, it was purposefully. Yes, yes. You know, it was not translational research, right? It was, it was basic research. It wasn't, it, it really, um, I think, I think the, cons the, the applied concerns that it generated were probably overstated. Okay. You don't hear much about it anymore. I mean, it didn't. You actually, we, you will be surprised. It's, it's, it's okay. You, you, the, you may hear a lot of that. Yes, it. in the dog industry, the dog mm -hmm. training in uh, communities, it's in the top of the list in certain. Really? Like, yes, yes. It's a very, it's a, it constantly is brought up. Um, and, and, yes, if we do, if we, if we do what you just said, of course, we're going to have some extreme results um uh, but yes it is um it's one of the the cards that could be played to 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 convince somebody no no you will this is well documented and and this is where you're headed you will you will create uh learn helplessness and the dog will just basically never try to avoid uh, and and will give up, and there will be no way out for for the rest of its life. Uh, well, it's I a see, very scary tactic. Hear, in the literature that I read, I don't see much uh, reference to it. Um, uh, maybe there are literature. I'm talking about basic sure. uh, operant literature. Um, but you know, it does remind me of a procedure that's commonly used in. Uh, um, the neurosciences, and that's uh, the forced swim test. And the way this works is you take a rat or a mouse, you take a rodent, and you put it in a tank of water, warm water, so it's not a shock or anything like that. And what is what is the what does the rat do? It does the dog paddle, you know, it treads water. And after a while, it stops. Now, when it stops, 
It doesn't drown. It floats. And this is commonly the time it takes for the animal to, to give up, the way they would put it is give up, is, is supposed to be uh, a sign of how long it takes for the how depressed the animal is likely to be. You right. Know? And, and giving up is, a sign, is, is, is taken as a sign of depression. But of course, the alternative is that the animal has learned to float. It's learned to stay on top of the water with much less effort. <laughs> and there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot of people around that I talk to in, in our health sciences center that see it that way. They say, I have to use this in my research because the grant agencies expect it. But I think it's ridiculous because it's not a good model for depression. It's mm -hmm. a good model for learning. For learning. So is it, is it, I mean, there's, it's like learned helplessness. Well, no, it's not. It's learning how to uh, float. Finding answers to the puzzle. Exactly. Right. Michael, anything that you want to talk about, because I know that I, I am asking a lot of questions, but I know that there is probably something that you anything that you feel that it's interesting and related to dogs and it will benefit dog trainers from your experience of, of, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I have anything, uh, worthwhile to say to dog trainers, uh, cause I'm just a rat psychologist. You know, I, uh, uh, I just study basic principles and in most cases we're not, uh, so in the basic principles with rats, what are the fundamentals that need to be there in order to be able to continue with with experimenting with the rat and not not uh, not have the rat being scared to do things for you and and have this uh, wrong responses well I'll, you know uh, when when we teach a rat how to avoid electric shock one of the things that we do is we are very judicious in the number of times we deliver a shock. It's a it's an, a unique stimulus. It's not something the animal encounters in nature. And um, it clearly frightens them. They uh, they will uh, they will whine, they will uh, defecate and urinate. And uh, that happens when they get their first first or second shock, they will, we will see that kind of emotional reaction. But within a few hours uh, of training over a period of two or three days, all that goes away as the animal acquires effective avoidance behavior. And, uh, and after, you know, a couple of weeks of training, you know, a, a couple hours a day, five or six days a week, what you see is a completely relaxed animal. They uh, they just don't. Uh, there's there's nothing in their overt behavior that would suggest that, that they are uh, damage for life. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, they live they live as long as uh, as as the rats in the food experiments do. You know, I've never I've never been bitten by a rat in a shock avoidance experiment. I have been bitten by rats in food experiments, food reinforcement experiments. It doesn't happen very often, but sure. it happens occasionally. And I think it's because the animals um, are uh, are food deprived, and uh, that generates a certain degree of agitation when they're when you yeah. start handling them, and it, it it sort of predicts food, so they start protesting the extinction. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's it's not it's not really aggression as much as it is uh, uh, confusion about uh, what it is that's out there to eat. Um, but you don't see that with the animals in the shock avoidance studies. They're pretty laid back. They're they're uh, they're pretty friendly. Yes, because one of the big one of the big arguments, and then I mean Skinner had quite a few arguments against punishment, but one big one was the the so-called counterattack the response of the animal to 
to punishment. How, how what, what about, I know you've done some work with uh, experimenting and, and studying timeout. Um, how, how is timeout affecting, so, so let, let, me, let me back up here. We, in dog training world, certain trainers believe that timeout is actually very benign and we can just use it almost any time at anything and it's the go-to approach if we have to do positive punishment versus timeout. What, is that correct statement? Well, uh, you know, my students and I, uh, within the last year, published a, uh, a paper that had seven experiments concerned with timeout from positive reinforcement, all in, all in rats. And um, we included, a, uh, within those seven experiments, one in which we ran a, a, the, the procedure, but instead of using timeout punishment, we used electric shock punishment. And timeout in, in, in our hands in the rat lab works pretty much like shock punishment does. Um, we don't see emotional byproducts in either case, mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're both effective in suppressing behavior. Now, in the laboratory, you don't want, you want to use a mild enough punishment so that you don't completely suppress Shut behavior. Shut down. Because yes. if you do that, you have nothing to study. So you, we look, we try to calibrate the stimuli so we get sort of an intermediate level of suppression. But time out from positive reinforcement is uh, is a very effective uh, punishment procedure. And uh, it's a punishment procedure. You know, I, people can call it whatever they want, but it's negative punishment. Yes. And uh, it is aversive. You know, yes, it's aversive. And, and, and the uh, uh, it's hard to see it in pure punishment studies, but the richer the time in environment, you know, the richer the the richer the environment is, then the more aversive a timeout should be. Now that's hard. That's hard to see in a in a in a punishment study for technical reasons. So we did some in this set of experiments. We did some avoidance experiments where the animal is avoiding timeout. What we did was we we put the rats in the chamber and they just got every once in a while on a var variable time schedule they got free food. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if 30 seconds passed without a lever press, they got a timeout. Timeout also happened to last 30 seconds. So under those circumstances, the rat learned to press the lever to avoid the timeouts. And what we were, they didn't have to press to get the food. The food's free. They had to press to avoid getting timeouts. To outs. stay in. That's right. And what we did was, uh, across conditions, we changed the rate of the free food deliveries. And it turns out that if the rate of food deliveries is very high, it's very dense, there's a lot of food, time, the time in is really good, then they will work harder to avoid the timeouts than if the food is relative, the food's uh, deliveries are, are relatively uh, sparse. So the better, the, the, the world is, the more aversive the timeout becomes. Um, it's kind of interesting because giving more food makes the world a better place, and I guess it does, but it makes the timeout much more aversive. So right. timeout from a rich, a richly rewarding environment should be a more effective punisher than timeout from a, 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 um, a less rewarding environment. But it's it's really interesting the number of people who I've heard over the years, uh, like daycare centers, they'll say, we don't use punishment, we use timeout. Correct. But of course, that is punishment. Yes, it's just playing words, like playing, <laughs> yes. And it's negative punishment. It's just like, it's like taking the car keys away from your adolescent son because he broke curfew. You know, that's, <laughs> the, the son will tell you he's been punished and, uh, and he has. But it's it's timeout from the from access to the car. What about the duration of timeout, and what about how when do we? Because there is that risk always of bringing the animal back in when it's not the the proper emotional state, right? 
we have not we have not studied that in my lab. We've only studied the uh, uh, we've only we, we hit on a thirty second timeout because thirty uh, seconds. The literature suggested that that was long enough to be effective, and uh, and it was in our experience. So we didn't fiddle with it because we weren't interested in that variable. But that is a variable that's well worth studying. You know, there's all these rules of thumb that uh, are out there in the uh, applied literature about how long a timeout should be depending on the age of the child. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, very little empirical uh, evidence to support those claims. My guess is that a time, it's a guess, uh, is the timeout uh, can be relatively brief and still be pretty effective. And then we have the, 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 the few different types of timeouts to where I, I mean obviously probably with the rats it's a little bit different but let's say in dog training we can take the dog and put it all the way away in the crate in the car out from the field or we can keep it present kind of like a hockey game and you get a penalty but you're actually on the bench watching versus mm -hmm. being totally taken away and removed yeah. from the game yeah, you're not sent to the locker room. Right. Yeah. And and they have they clearly have different effect on on um uh, I think the in a lot of cases that that timeout that you you're still there but you're not allowed to participate um can be more effective than completely taking away and then the dog or or whatever the animal is it's almost at the point that it forgets I would just put away. There is not really association anymore of, of why I'm coming back on the field now. Is it just another session or is it a, we're back from penalty? That's interesting. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a very interesting observation that had, that had never occurred to me. And I have to think about whether there's a, a way to uh, mimic that sort of thing in the laboratory see if we can model that in the laboratory. I have to make a note of that after we're done. That's, uh, that's very interesting indeed, yes. Hmm. Hadn't thought about that one, that's a, that's a good one. Okay, Michael, I think we, we I mean, it, I would say excellent conversation and I, I'm sure this is gonna create a lot of conversations among the dog training community like I, I didn't know where we're gonna go with this, but uh, I'm I'm very happy of of everything that we covered. It's it's very interesting, and I cannot thank you enough for for oh, accepting that. My pleasure. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, and you've left me with a uh, uh, an idea to uh, talk about with my students. See if we can design some new experiments. Yeah. Any anything that you may need dogs for experiments or ideas <laughs> we're here they are uh they are very expensive animals to yes. have as subjects yes dogs are but everybody when you say dogs and research there is a the the interest goes off the roof immediately because it, it it's a special place with the dogs yeah well it, it would be uh would be something to think about. It, you know, you there probably would be uh, uh, dog owners in the in the university community that would be happy to uh, lend their uh, dogs to us for a few hours if yes. we went to their homes. Well, I like to try it with rats first. Right. That's your yes, yes. Of course. I mean, for for whatever or reason, pigeons, or pigeons, you know. Yes, for whatever <laughs> reason, that's where it starts. Right. It's a, it's well, a, it, they're so convenient. Yes. You know, they live right there. I just have to walk down the hall and there they are. Thank you. Th really, like, thank I you. cannot thank you enough for, for coming to the podcast. And as I said, like, it, it will be, this will be watched over and over from, from a lot of dog trainers because I, I, I will personally watch it myself because it's different when I'm talking and listening. To where I can just sit back and listen to you talking about all this stuff. It, it was very, very interesting. And, and, and you're very, thank you're very you. kind. Thank you. Thank you so much.